Welcome, everyone, and thank you for taking the time today to join us to learn some inside tips on how to wow your best customers. This is the final webinar in our three-part series brought to you by Allegra Marketing Print Mail. If you missed the past two webinars about impactful branding and turning your leads into loyal customers, or maybe you'd just like to review them again, you can find those recordings at www.allegrawebinars.com. And that's also where you will find the recording of today's webinar after this live event. My name is Tiffany Moss, and I am so excited to be the moderator today as we talk about something I think all companies and organizations strive to do more of, and that is really wowing your best customers or donors. So just a couple things before we get started. Please interact with us by using the chat box and the hashtag Allegra Webinars, and you'll also be sent a recording following the webinar. So throughout the series, you've heard us refer to the customer journey and meeting the customer where they're at in their journey. We talked about how to build your branding for those in the awareness phase, and also how to convert those that are uh, in the consideration phase into loyal customers. Today, we're gonna dig a little bit deeper into the retention and advocacy phases. These people have become customers and they've decided to work with your business, but how can we expand that relationship? How can we really wow them into becoming your brand advocates? Well, lucky for all of us here, Carla Johnson is full of great ideas that can really help turn our customers into those true advocates. So for those of you that are new here, Carla is a world-renowned speaker, author, and storyteller. She's written or contributed to eight books with two more on the way. In her latest book, Fast Forward Files, she contributes to a larger collection of thoughts by some of the world's greatest minds. People like the Shazam co-founder, activist and entrepreneur Heather Mills, and behavioral designist, technologist, and mental health champion Peter Trainer. Named one of the top 50 women in marketing and consistently listed as a top influencer in B2B and content marketing, Carla regularly challenges conventional thinking, and that's really what we're all here for today. So with that, I'd like to welcome Carla. Thank you so much for that fabulous introduction, Tiffany, and welcome everybody. I'm really excited to, to spend some time with you here today because I know as businesses and especially as marketers, we're always looking for new ways to wow our best customers and, and make, <laughs> make sure that they stay with us. And we hear that it takes 12 times the work and investment to bring in a new customer. But even knowing that, we don't always give the love to our current customers that we should. And part of the reason is that we make the front end sales and marketing part of attracting and converting people to customers really sexy. But we don't think about what it takes to maintain that relationship in the long run. But I tell you, this is what successful companies understand, and it's what they get right. And in fact, Tiffany, this morning I was doing some reading, and I found an article from the CEO of Drift. His name is David Cancel, and he said that focusing on the exact things that we're going to talk about today is the key to how he's built such a successful company in really such a short amount of time. And it's the reasons that CEOs like David Cancel and marketers like us and everybody else in that customer relationship you know, area of the business is the reason the success comes is because we look at it as a long-term investment. And when you do that, you really make decisions differently. And it's these successful brands that understand that the way that you create these long-term relationships is through people and those people are your employees and there's a huge glaring difference between the brands that understand this and those that don't so if we look at some of the media coverage about how employees behave there are headlines about employees who aren't happy about one thing or another and there's a horror stories about these employees who you know they're on their social media accounts and they think they're on their personal ones and they're actually either on their company's social media account or maybe their clients, and they accidentally share something that's absolutely humiliating. And when this happens, it's not just humiliating for their employers, it's also incredibly embarrassing for um, their customers because they don't wanna be affiliated with a brand that behaves this way. And it's something that we see happen in the fast food industry all the time. I mean, pictures like these two, the employee who's taking a nap on the bags of the hamburger buns or eating ice cream right out of the dispenser. And we think, you know, this is really kind of crazy. 
But the airline is no, the airline industry, it's no stranger to this kind of employee behavior. And this is one of my favorite stories of, of uh, employee behavior gone bad. And it's, um, it's about Dave Carroll. And he had bought a ticket on United to travel from Halifax, Canada to Omaha, Nebraska. And when he landed, he found that his $3,500 guitar was damaged. And when he reported it to United, they said, well, you didn't file a claim in 24 hours, so we're not responsible for anything. So Dave did what any great songwriter would do. He wrote a song about it. And in the first 24 hours, he had over 150,000 views on YouTube. And now a decade later, it's over 20 million views. And people still use that as an example of, of how to hurt that long-term customer relationship. And here's an example of a brand that's not even in the airline industry that's still using that example to promote themselves. So when your employees represent your brand and it goes bad, that lasts forever, forever. And you might think, you know, that's so crazy, but I'm safe because, you know, we my employees don't eat ice cream on the job and they don't break guitars and things like that, but they do represent your brand. And you may wake up one morning and find out that one of your employees is on the news for something that they've done, and that absolutely is a direct reflection on your brand. And there's a price tag associated with employee behavior. Now, the question for you is this. Is this a price that you pay? Or is it an investment that you can make in order to create more revenue that you want to earn? Now, we understand that we need to think of customers as individuals, as real people. But we're not good at thinking about our company as people. And at best, we think of our company in terms of departments. But when we talk about branding and finding your brand's unique qualities, qualities, yeah, and, and creating this chemical attraction for the sales cycle, none of that can happen without what we're going to talk about today. And that's the employee inside your company and how they represent you, good, bad, or different. Because people do business with other people who, oh, by the way, happen to work for a brand, but it's that person-to-person -person relationship that really matters. Now, we can look at this employee relationship, and it's really the one that makes or breaks the customer relationship, because how employees show up and represent your brand is a direct reflection of how employees are treated. So this is a huge message for marketers, because we have to look at how much we market internally as we do how and what we do to market externally, because this is the army of people who represent our brand. And we have to make sure that they feel that they have a great relationship that they're conveying to the outside world. And a big part of this is just the basic employment situation in the US today. So it's really at a record breaking low since 1969. I mean, 3.7% unemployment. So the competition to find and keep great talent is more strong than our competition to find customers. And what we have to do is think about not only how do sales and marketing represent our brand, but how does the rest of the entire company represent us as well? Because this is a statistic from Gallup State of the Workforce report. And 51% of US employees are actively looking for a new job. So when more than half of your employees are looking for their next gig, marketers have to think about what they can do to build the relationship between their brand and the people who represent it. <clears throat> now the question you need to ask yourself is this, are you grooming the competition's next employee or are you getting ready to steal their best employees? Because when we look at there are so many workers who are disengaged. And this matters a huge amount, especially for small and medium-sized businesses because disengaged employees cost their employers a lot of money. And small and medium-sized businesses are the ones who can least afford it. So when an employee is disengaged, just over a third of their salary is lost to absenteeism, lower productivity, lower profitability. So think about this with all the things that you want to get thing that you want to get done. 
from marketing to sales to delivery on all of the promises that you're making, how are you gonna do this and still make a profit if you're essentially paying a third more on everything that you need to get the job done? So this is really important. It's, an, it's a point of view that marketers don't always think of, but it's an important one for us to keep in mind because 22% of employees strongly agree that leadership has a clear direction about their organization and, and where it's going. Now, we don't know if the organization actually does have a clear direction or not. That's not part of, of this study, but it's the perception of the employees and perception equals reality. And would you, would you get in, onto a plane or would you get into a car if you didn't have a clear direction for where it was going? You think about that and you say, well, of course not. I wanna know where it's going, how long it's gonna to take to get there, what's involved, but yet this is what happens every single day when we go to work. Employees don't have a sense of where it is our company is going and, and what the goal is to get there, how long it takes. So if employees don't know how they're getting there, how can they get excited about coming to work every day? So what we have to do is paint a picture for them and let them know how they can contribute because this is how you get them excited and enthusiastic about the, about the future and what their role is. So you now we look at this statistic, only 13% of employees strongly agree that leadership communicates effectively with the organization. And this is directly where marketing comes in because marketing doesn't just mean demand generation, lead generation, conversion and, and sales and, and things like that. Marketing is very much the storyteller of the organization. And we have to make sure that we are telling that story internally as strong and as consistently as we do externally. And Tiffany, I know you and I had talked about this last week when we caught up and you know, just making sure that marketers ask that question, if I am a marketer, how can I in affect all of these internal issues with employees that's going on? And I don't know, I'll, I know I've covered a lot right here in the beginning. Do you wanna see, the, does anybody have any questions so far? Well, no, actually, I think that was the one that did come in. We did have somebody ask, just said, you know, I'm a member of a marketing team. I'm, I'm not in HR. How can I affect those employee issues? So sounds like that's what we'll cover with the rest of it. Yeah, and, and you know that, that question about marketing's relationship with HR, that I'm, I'm glad somebody asked that because it's one that marketers think, you know, they're about hiring, they're about benefits, they're about all those other things, and I'm over here and, and I have a separate job to do. But really the ability for marketing to partner with HR is the first step in creating a really strong customer relationship that we don't think about because we're hiring the people who are going to represent the brand um, and how they behave and what they do and what they value really needs to be in line with what we do. And going back to that, that competition for talent and the low unemployment rate, this is why marketers need to start to get curious and and nosy and get involved with what HR is doing because it matters significantly to the work that marketers do and the impact that we can have. Now, I had a, um, a, a client a few years ago who was turning their entire company around because they understood that the customer relationship started with a successful employee relationship. And <clears throat> they made sure to take care of their current customers. But what they also did is that they overhauled the entire process of recruiting, onboarding, training, educating, activating employees. And even within the first 18 months, they saw a significant difference in customer acquisition, in customer retention, in customer satisfaction, in the revenue that they, that they were able to earn per customer. Um, these are significant things, and that's why we have to look at this employee relationship part of our customer relationship, because disengaged employees cost companies a lot of money. Um, and small and medium-sized businesses are the ones who can hardly afford to do, hardly afford to spend this money. So 
companies that have engaged employees, employees who understand the direction of the company, who understand the vision, understand what's going on, have regular communication, outperform those without engaged employees by over 200%. So this is, this is such a big step. And it's why we're going to talk about what it is that we're going to talk about today. So the first thing is that we're going to talk about education. It's one of three things that we're going to cover. So if we look at how many years we spend on, in our life on education and understanding the world around us, it's a lot of years. And then we get our first job and we tend to go there and say, okay, now it's my time to do. And we don't think about, well, wait a minute, I still need to have these interactions just like I did in university or tech school or wherever high school, wherever you got your education. And we have to look at what is that education about the work that we do? How does it impact the customer relationship that we have? So that's, that's the first step is looking at that. And <laughs> bad communication is one of the biggest drains on company revenues. And it's just, communication is so important because when people don't understand what to do, they either don't do anything or they make up their own recipe and they do the wrong thing. And, and that can be extremely costly to a company. I mean, you go back to United's policy about you have to um, file a claim within 24 hours and you see what happened because of it. And they're, you know, they're still the butt of people's jokes. And looking at, okay, how can we invest in communication that alleviates these misunderstandings, helps them serve our customers better, and helps us create a better, more resilient brand? So as we look at education and what it involves, there's a couple of things that I want you to keep in mind. First is I want you to look at how you can teach employees the customer journey and how everything connects internally. Now, I teach advanced customer experience classes at, at several universities, and this is the one thing that I hear, not just from marketers, but from students from different parts of the organization. They say, you know what? If I had understood this before, I would have been making decisions about my job completely differently. So this is why it's so important for everybody to understand the journey that our customer takes to um, find an ant to understand their problem, find an answer to the problem, you know, find our brand, they're converted to a customer. Now, what does that journey look like afterwards? Because it helps everybody understand how all the parts and pieces connect internally to a company. And that makes a significant difference in how marketing behaves and really how we're able to connect the dots across the entire organization. Now, this is how the great and most successful companies start to think about long-term relationships rather than short-term transactions. Because if you think that your role is only this one little piece of the pie or snippet in time, you don't understand the cause and effect of what it is that you do. So that's why educating people on what your customer journey is and what their part and piece is and the before and after, it helps give them a cohesive, bigger picture story. So customer journeys, take many different forms. This is an example of one from serious decisions. And this is more demand gen focused rather than entire customer journey focused, but at least it starts to show the interrelationships and, and what happens when customers take what kind of, of behavior or what kind of action. Now, this is one from McKinsey. And this is, I would say this is one of the most accurate, although also one of the most simplified because it shows this continuing relationship that we want to create with customers. And that's that loyalty loop in the middle. And this is what we have to look at. Like, where does everybody in our organization fit into this small type of diagram? Now, here's an example of a company. I, I love, love this picture. So what they did is on the left, you can see they mapped the customer journey in the loyalty loop type of um, arrangement. And the different colored post-it notes are the different types of people throughout the company who are involved and what their role is. Now, when you look to the right, this is a customer journey from beginning to end. And you can see it, it goes down the hall and wraps around the corner. Now, this is so important because they're clearly understanding this relationship 
about the employee journey and the customer journey and how it's all connected for the foundation of customer experience. And customer experience is all about employees understanding the journey. So there was a survey from West Monroe Partners that found that half of their respondents said that a motivated and equipped workforce were the most critical things they needed to, to accomplish their goals for customer experience, for business agility, <clears throat> and for their, their digital business transformation goals. And we hear so much about transformation and, and integration and, and all of this today. <clears throat> so these are huge things to keep in mind. But these same companies ranked employee engagement employee experience and employee enablement at the bottom of their company's top priorities. So even though they understand they're the most important things for activating customers and developing these long-term relationships, they're making them one of the lowest priorities for their company. Now, I wanna tell you and uh, share a little story about a company who really understands this and has done a really good job with it. So. The Credit Union of Texas started in 1931, so right after the, the Great Depression, and they had a total assets under management of $65. So that's right, $65 right after the Great Depression. It, it was a lot to start out with, uh, with assets. So today they've grown to over $1.4 billion in assets, and they have over um, almost 150,000 members in all 50 states. So they're a member-owned financial institution. Now what they did is after looking at the customer journey, they understood the frustration that they were forcing onto customers. So I know I hate it when I have to, um, I have to think about, okay, I have to deal with something with my bank and it's gonna be about money. And, and this is one of people in general this is one of people's biggest stressors is, is to talk about money and deal with their financial institutions. And it doesn't matter if we <clears throat> walk into a bank, if we wait in line, um, the teller tells us, okay, great, uh, I'd love to help you, but you have to talk to somebody else and then you have to wait in line again. Or if you call in, you have to give your information, it seems like to 14 different people and you're on hold forever. And it, it's just a bad situation. And that's what the credit union understood, understood was happening with their customers. So what they also had were highly engaged employees who cared deeply about their customers. So what they did is they mapped the customer journey and then they worked with all of their employees so that they could understand it. And then once the employees understood it, then they backed it up with the systems and the processes that they need to put it in place that made it much easier for employees to deliver the experience that made customers go, wow, I can't believe that that just happened at my bank. And it is, it's crazy about the kind of um, response that they're getting. Now, I wanna show you two charts here, or two, two things here. On the left, <clears throat> these are employee reviews about the Texas Credit, about the Credit Union of Texas that are on Glassdoor. So you can see they have a 4.4 out of five stars. They have a 90% approval of the CEO. 85% um, of them are likely to recommend their employer to a friend. Now, now this is big because we can invest a lot in marketing and sales, but it's really that word of mouth that helps not only draw new customers in, it's what helps them stay because it's the behind the scenes story that people hear about a company. Now you look at the, the pros and cons. Okay, great, the pros, they place high emphasis on work-life balance. I mean, things you want to hear said about your company. Okay, the downside of working there um, is that they feed us so much with great food that you may put on a few pounds. You know, the other, nothing negative, great work environment. You know, imagine if that was the worst thing that people said about working at your own company. Now you take this, this is employee reviews and the experience they have as an employee working there. And you translate that over onto the right. And these are the, the reviews that customers are giving the, the credit union. You know, they love the staff, everybody's kind. Um, they go beyond what needs to be done to help. They're professional, they're courteous. You know, here's a single person who is one of my favorite people to do business with. And that goes back to the a d idea that we do business with people, not with brands. And that's what the Credit Union of Texas really understands well. Now, the second thing that I wanna talk about is empowerment. 
And as we look at what is it that we can do once we've educated employees, okay, now how do we actually empower them so, that, so they can do something with what it is that we've taught them? And when we look at empowerment, I wanna just be, be clear on what I'm talking about. So employee empowerment is, is giving the employees a certain degree of autonomy and responsibility for making decisions that essentially deal with whatever it is they're responsible for. And you think about the number of times you've called someplace to ask for help, and if you consistently get, just a minute, I have to ask my manager for approval, I don't know, um, it's really frustrating. But when an employee can take that on themselves, it gives them a great sense of purpose, of contribution, and making a difference and being helpful for that customer. So re research has demonstrated, actually, that when employees feel empowered at work, that they deliver a stronger job performance, greater satisfaction, and greater commitment to the organization. Now, this, this really matters in wowing your customers and building those relationships because it's what makes the employees go above, on, above and beyond to take care of that customer and make sure that whatever their issue is, that it's resolved and they go beyond just what their job description may be. So, so this is huge in building those long-term relationships with customers. Now, when we look at empowerment, it's this is how you begin to tap into those unique brand attributes that build customer loyalty for your company. Because if, if you were part of our previous webinar about impact branding, or you wanna refresh it, or you, were, you, know, you didn't hear it, here's the link, you can go back and listen to it. But empowerment is the ability to take what it is that's unique and different and special about your brand, and then giving the employees the green light to make it come alive so they they understand what they're able to do what they're allowed to do what those you know bumpers are along the side so they don't get their hand slapped if if they make an effort to do something so that's what empowerment is and that's the second step now when you look at how do you actually start to empower employees and make things happen there's five things that you can start to do so the first is you know, simple, just start to hand out responsibility. And sometimes I hear um, managers say, well, I'm not really sure that they're ready for it. Okay, you know what, start small. And remember this, like the reason you hired somebody is because you needed to be able to scale what you're able to deliver as a marketer, because you in one role as a marketer can never do everything that needs to be done. So how can you start to hand out some responsibility and nurture and groom perhaps some of those younger people on your team or maybe some people who are transitioning into new and different roles. How is it that you can start to hand out responsibility? That's really important, that's number one. Now, the second, ones, second one is to make guidelines and best practices clear. So if you're going to hand out the responsibility, you don't just wanna hand out and say, you know, see ya, you know, let me know if you have any problems. Give them some guidance and show them what has worked and probably wasn't a good idea in the past because this this helps them understand where the green path is and where the rough patches are that that they should avoid so that's your second one to give them some guidelines and make best practices clear now the third one encourage communication that was one of those big things that kept showing up on the on the gallup state of the workforce report is that people didn't know what was going on and so if you're going to empower someone, what you need to do is that you make sure to help them understand, you know, how they're doing well, where they're doing well, you know, what's changed someplace else that may affect what's going on. This is really important in just general direction of the company and, and how it's going, because that can affect that relationship that they have with their direct customer. The fourth thing is offer some coaching and feedback at many different levels. You can do it one-to-one -one with somebody, you can do it as a team. And I see more and more companies who are looking into peer coaching because people on a team have different strengths and you can't always spend the time as a manager to coach people one-on-one -on -one or to coach them as a team. So take advantage of the strengths of your team and let them help each other because that also helps them feel more responsible and it's a way to hand out some of that extra responsibility and it helps them feel more confident about what it is that they already know. Now the fifth way 
is to allow opportunities for growth. So it's one thing to be empowered, but it's another thing to see that the scope of what it is that you're able to manage and be responsible, responsible for can really grow. And that's where allowing opportunities for growth is so important. So those really are five things that you can start to think about today, this afternoon, as soon as we're done with this webinar, and start to think about how you could make some of those happen in your own company. Now, the third thing we're gonna talk about, talk about is activation. So you've educated your employees on the customer journey, what their role is, how all the dots connect with that. You've now empowered them to take action, but sometimes they need a little push and that's what employee activation is. So when we look at it, it, it actually is a more formalized program that encourages employees in a business to, to start to take on some of this responsibility and growth themselves and share information about what is it that interests them. And employee activation really is the key to driving your business with greater resiliency, with what's needed in, um, you know, in this post-digital world. There's been so much emphasis on digital transformation and, and digital business and digital marketing, but really we're looking at a, a comprehensive online, offline, you know, digital print kind of, world now and with that you have to be able to activate those employees so they understand what they can do to take that ball and then run with it so when we look at this if you help brand your people and bring their expertise to the forefront they will help you brand your companies in ways that you never could imagine and and i see companies do this over and over again they will see a rock star person you know, maybe um, at an event, it could be a white paper that they've written, it could be, um, you know, a blog or something that they have, and they think, wow, this is amazing. Who is, you know, like, who do they work for? And that's an, a different kind of way to look at the branding of your company. Now, Adobe does an amazing job with this. So when we look at Adobe, one of the things that we see is that they're a company that is able to attract this top tier talent. And they're known for um, training. They're, they understand that an improved reputation helps with everything that they do as a company. And this is Lauren Friedman. And she's looking at, um, she looks at this from the point of view of how do we add more trust into the work that we do? So relationships, are the fuel for the overall success of the organization. And, and I love what she says here about, we don't wanna create an army of Adobe bots who all sound the same, look the same, because that goes back to you're just building this uh, faceless, um, Samesville kind of company rather than this whole group of real rich people that people do business with. And they're known for you know spending time to manage and, and train and empower their employees so that they speak up. And they have an official training program that they call a social shift. And what they have learned is that there's two and a half billion people online and 46% of them, so almost half of the people, turn to social media to make a buying decision. And they understand that the number of people following Adobe online is growing, but every every day what people look at is who are the people who work for Adobe who I build those relationships with. And that's how Adobe is able to continue to, you know, grow the number of times they're referenced, you know, how many times they're, they're mentioned online. And they look at, they did um, research and they see that customers are twice as likely to buy from Adobe if they feel socially engaged with the brand because people trust employees twice as much as they trust an executive, you know, a, a CEO, a CIO, um, a CMO. And Adobe customers really expect that personal touch. And that's why the relationship part is so strong. And if you look at the employees, um, the activation things that they've done is that beyond the fact that they've trained over, or just about a third of their employees on social media, it doesn't just stop with, with the training that they've done. What they do is they say, okay, you guys are all experts. You have amazing relationships face-to-face -face with our customers. 
um, you have these interactions, you know so much information that is really valuable to other people, other customers, and actually that our employees can learn from. And so what they have done is that after people go through their social media training program, they get an opportunity to become these brand champions, and they're the ones who tell the company's story. And some of them, you know, they're, they're all encouraged, but a lot of them will contribute to this Adobe blog where it talks about a, a behind the scenes view of what their workday looks like. And this draws over 10,000 views a month. And it's a lot of interviews of employees, um, things that employees have written and shared, and, and other kind of things. Now, this matters so much to Adobe because this is how they're able to take employees that they've educated, they've empowered to do things, and now they've actually activated them so that they will take action and they're more proactive in how they think about those customer relationships. How can we create an internal ecosystem that is more customer focused and less, less focusing so much on just the products and the services that we sell? So this is, this is how Adobe has been phenomenally successful. And when you look at what is it that you can take from what Adobe has done and transplant it into the work that you do, here are seven tips that I wanna share with you so that you can start to activate your employees. So the first one, is really just start small. So many people think that we have to make employee activation this huge program that takes a lot of time, it takes you know a phenomenal amount of resources. It doesn't, you can just start with one very small thing. And maybe it's something just as simple as, if you like working here, tell a friend. You know, to, uh, um, tell, you know, put something on Facebook about what you're, you know, about concert t-shirt Friday or something like that at the office, you know, something unique and different that you do, just encourage them to share that. That's just a simple, small step that you can start toward activating employees. Now, the second one is make it about personal branding. And this is where employees start to feel ownership of, of what they're doing, because it's one thing to say, you know, do this for the company, do this for the brand. But when they start to think about, oh, how do I show up in the world? they start to take it quite a bit more seriously because they think about how will my friends think about this if I share it? Like, it's not just about the company I work for now, it's about me. So they take it to heart and they're, they're much more thoughtful about what it is that they do. Now, the third thing that you can do to activate employees is teach them how to be an activator. And it's not just about spoon feeding them content to share or spoon feeding them a message to share or a story. Teach them how to do it themselves so that they know, they know what the guidelines are, they understand the parameters, um, and they know how to fish themselves rather than you hand feeding them all the time. Now the fourth one, make it easy. We are so busy in our world today that anything that takes additional time, effort, you know, it's it's most likely we'll either put it on a shelf and say, I'll do it when I get to it, or we're, we know that we're just never going to get to it. So you have to make it convenient for people. And then once it's convenient and they start to do it, that will build that habit of activation for them. Now, the fifth thing, incentivize people with contests. I had um, a, a friend who did this. She worked for Molson Coors here in Denver, and they had contests about how many times you could um, you could go share a story about the brand and, and then come back and share that story internally on their internal communication channels. And, you know, they started to incentivize them with things and people really caught on because, you know, as people were competitive and uh, when they saw also that other people were sharing it made it safer for them to talk about their own experience. So contests are a nice way to, to activate employees who might be hesitant otherwise to do something. <clears throat> now the sixth thing is leverage technology where it makes sense, but also make it tangible offline. And this is where things like, um, I have one client who they have their company name and the um, slogan for their employee activation program on those little rubber bands, you know, wide bands that you can wear around their wrists. So it's always very tangible. Um, maybe it's a poster that you have in a high traffic area. Maybe it's coffee mug, maybe it's some sort of reward. But people like tangible offline things 
to see what they're doing because not everybody wants to spend all the time online with the work that they do. Now, the last one, number seven, use your advocates wisely. You may have some people who are just going, just gangbusters with, with what's going on and you'll have different tiers of, of excitement and participation. Make sure you don't consistently tap into the same people over and over again, because after a while, even they will get worn out and they'll say, geez, am I the only one you're asking to do some of these things? You have to make sure that you're, you're spreading the love, so to speak, and, and don't wear people out and use the right people in, in the right way. So there are seven tips that you can use to start to activate your employees today. So what I wanted to talk about last is what you can do today um, to take some next steps beyond these individual ones that I've, that I've talked about for education and empowerment and activation. So first thing I want you to do is assess. What do you have in place right now based on what we've talked about? Like, do you have a customer journey map? Do you have an employee journey map? Um, what gaps do you start to see and start to look at those holes and how you can fill those in. Now, the second thing, prioritize. You may find a slew of gaps or you may find just a few, but we all have to have our focus when we come to work. So what are the biggest priorities that relate to the relationship that you have with your customers? And, and look at those and start taking those off by by what's the most important. Because like, like for instance, if the most painful part of your customer journey is when you onboard them as a customer, make that your top priority because that is a big part of a relationship. Now, the last one is commit. Delivering these amazing experiences that wow your customers aren't going to happen overnight. And it's not a, I decide to do it and now it just happens. But look at how you can consistently and continually improve the maturity and the sophistication that you have with how you educate, empower, and activate your employees and how you nurture that relationship between employees, not just a brand, employees and customers. That's what is so important to keep in mind. So with that, Tiffany, I will turn it back to you. All right. Thank you, Carla. So I hope this has everybody thinking of some new ways to really think about how both your employee and customer advocacy really work together. And if you haven't thought about it this way before, I think now's a really good time to start. And the good thing is that Allegra Marketing Print Mail already has a range of ideas on how to help you build your team up so that they can provide that five-star customer experience. So whether it's through promotional gifts for employees or maybe spotlighting some employees in your company newsletters or your training manuals, and then even recognizing some employees with awards and certificates, Allegra has done it before and is ready to get started on that for you now as well. And after listening to Carla today, I think we can all really agree that making sure your company's focus and values are front and center through something as simple as posters or signs in the workplace can really have a significant impact on the experience that your employees are giving your customers. And if you're looking for some great ways to maybe get some of that feedback to share and empower your team, let us know because we have many tried and true tactics like customer surveys for collecting that feedback. So just make sure to keep us in mind because you don't have to go at this alone. And while, we, while Carla was speaking, we got many really good questions that came in. So I'm just going to go through a few of those now, Carla. Sounds great. So one of the ones we have is, in what instances would you use your employee engagement or satisfaction as a marketing message? Here's, here's an important thing to keep in mind, is that you as a brand, it's hard for you to say, we have engaged employees and have it feel authentic. It's an example, it's a situation of show, don't tell. So employees who are engaged, one, they're gonna talk about the company, uh, whether it's um, at the neighborhood barbecue, whether it's at a conference and they represent the company, or if it's uh, what they write about or share on social media, help them tell the story of their engagement. Um, you know, there'll be times where, especially for HR if you're recruiting, and this is great for marketers who are helping HR with that, um, with uh, recruiting and onboarding efforts, is to, take some specific testimonials, some examples from employees 
who are engaged and what it means to the, what it means to them and have them tell the story in their words and you know use it in recruiting videos use it in the brochures use it in um, you know even internal posters in your company to remind people here's what you know Kevin who works in accounting loves about working here you know here's what Shelly in IT loves about working here because people will become more like the people they surround themselves with so if you surround employees with stories and messages of other employees who love working there, who are engaged, you're going to fuel that want and need and, and cultural value of becoming engaged. All right, that's great. So we had a question jumping back to the stat about 51% of employers or employees are actively looking for new openings. And um, the question is, if you think that there's a relationship between a low confidence rate in their leadership to that 51% of people that are looking around? Oh, absolutely. I, I believe there's an extremely strong correlation there. And it can be as simple as the leaders may be amazing, highly competent, absolutely have the company on the right direction, but nobody knows it. You go back to thinking about if you if you get on a plane and the pilot never tells you where you're going, never tells you how long you're going to get there. I, I know if I'm on a plane for a couple of hours and I don't know where I'm going or how long I'm going to get there, how long it's going to take to get there. I'm going to question that pilot and I might start to look around like, how do I how do I get off this thing? Just like the pilot comes on, you know, the airplane and says, hey, you know, welcome aboard. Here's what we're doing. Here's what to expect. And, you know, along the way, along the route they speak with you that's the reason that pilots do it it's it's why when you're in a car people say you know how many more miles how long is it going to take when can i stop and go to the bathroom if you've ever been in a car with you know a long haul car trip with kids you know what that's like it's the same kind of thing with employees so if they don't know where they're going why or how long it's going to take to get there they're absolutely looking around for something better all right, and we have another one that's actually a really good follow-up to that. So what advice do you have to introduce this, uh, this need for this focus or direction to those executives or owners or that leadership team? You know what, it always, with that audience, it always absolutely positively goes down to the bottom line. What are the numbers? And um, this, the Gallup state of the workforce uh, research is online. They also have research about employee engagement and that impact on revenue. So I would encourage you um, to look for those to look for those studies because they're they're highly impactful to executives. One, it's research. Two, it's numbers and financial based. So what you can do is if you talk about in your own organization the challenges that you're having, perhaps with meeting goals customer retention, customer acquisition, you can show <clears throat> how uh, educating, empowering, activating employees has a direct relationship on the success of those goals. So the important thing to do when you have this conversation is not to have the conversation as a marketer, but to have this conversation as a business person who is talking to these executives from the point of view of, I understand, here's the business objectives and goals and numbers we have to meet as a business so what i think may you know here's an idea i have you know i was looking at this research i attended this allegra webinar and this is what i learned and then then ease that way into ideas you may have or requests for you know can i can i get two or three people together and we can start to look into this and see what we can do as marketers to start to empower employees you have some tips on that how to activate employees, you have some tips on that, maybe how to start to assess, prioritize, and commit to some things. Um, th these are crucial. And I always say, if you don't know where to start, start with that customer journey, because that's something that directly ties in to sales, most importantly for marketers, but also for marketers. So you can start to build that relationship. And if you're going to be able to activate prospects and turn them into customers and retain them as customers you have to understand the customer journey and then teach employees what their role is their specific role and how it is impacted by the bigger picture and how the little things that they do every day affects the people after them 
and is impacted by the people before them. So I see this especially when we do customer journey mapping workshops with both sales and marketing people in the room. They start to go, oh my gosh, I now understand why sales has a fit every time I do X, Y, or Z. And sales will say, oh my word, I now understand why every time I get into that first conversation with a customer, I'm having the same conversation over and over and over again. Because now they start to understand the customer journey and the interrelationship, and they're able to make, uh, uh, they're able to create more educated buyers earlier in the process who are um, educated in a way that is conducive to how that company sells, and then also helps them understand how they retain, upsell, you know, make that customer a more valuable and more loyal customer. So then speaking of that customer journey, how can I teach others about a customer journey? Well, first of all, I, I'm just gonna say this. I would assume if you're asking the question, then you already have your customer journey map. So that's my thing is, is first map it. Um, if it is something that your company has never talked about before, what I suggest doing, and I'm, and I'm just, I don't have any idea how big your company is. So I'm gonna kind of say some things and if you want some follow-up questions, make sure to ask Tiffany. Um, oftentimes, I sit down one-on-one -on -one and uh, I always say marketing people should start with salespeople and they should start from the, the frame of reference of here's something I'd like your input on that I'm trying to help marketing be more supportive and uh, the things that we help sales with be more successful. So right there, you have the salesperson's attention because you're talking to them about how to make them more successful as a salesperson. You sit down with the salesperson and you say, um, either here's the customer journey that we have mapped, here's a customer journey that I think we follow. Again, I, I don't know how you came up with the customer journey. Ask the salespeople to look at it and, and for their input because they may look at it and go, oh, this is total baloney because what actually happens here is this, this, and this. And one thing that you'll see is that your sales, your customer journey is going to get much more layered than you ever would have imagined because you'll have marketing involved, then you have an overlay of sales that's involved, then you have an overlay of probably IT that's involved. If you have any digital marketing, then probably an overlay of, of finance because somebody has to approve all these different things. And you start to see the interconnectedness of what happens internally with employees. So then you understand the impact that it all has on customers. So I say start with sales because then once you're on the same page as sales, then you collectively can go to finance to plead your case or to IT. You can slowly collect your supporters and it's kind of like the Pied Piper, how everybody you know followed and it got bigger and bigger and bigger. You can do the same thing just starting out with those one-on-one -on -one conversations. Now, if you are looking to um, have a bigger mass impact, have a brown bag lunch. Make your own internal webinar. You know, just think about how you would train external audiences on something and take some of those same approaches and now just turn it internally. And you know, I always say, make it fun. Make it fun so people wanna show up, make it fun so they wanna stay, and make it fun so they wanna tell other people about it. Okay, so if we kind of think the other way, do you have any, idea, any ideas on what to do with those employees that aren't buying in? Can they be saved? You know what? I'll, I'll be honest. I believe that there is a certain layer of employees in every single company who are negative, who are disengaged, and who <laughs> it doesn't matter how awesome and perfect your company may be, they will always find fault. So what I suggest doing is, you know, make sure you support the people who are already engaged and just superpower them. Now look at those those that group of people who is neither actively engaged or disengaged and try to move them up on on the engagement level um and i would i would do some homework and find out what it is about the disengaged employees that's making them disengaged because maybe there's something that you're ignoring as um, as a marketer or as an employer 
that could be fairly simple to fix. Maybe part of the disengagement is poor or no communication. All right, so I think that's all the questions we have gotten so far today. Um, so again, I just want to thank everybody for taking the time to join us, and I, I hope you really did take some action items from this webinar because I think there's some things in here that really will make a difference. But always, if you need additional support, be sure to contact your local expert at Allegra. And if you aren't already working with us, you can find your nearest partner by visiting www.allegramarketingprint.com. So thank you again, Carla, and we hope you all have a wonderful day.